Hi, I'm Graham Blackburn, and in this episode of Traditional Woodworking Hand Tools, we're going to be talking about the Ripsaw. Hi, you know, in a hand tool wood shop, there are all kinds of saws. Today, we're just going to be talking about one of the hand saw family. Um, it's called a hand saw because it's just a blade with one handle, not to be confused with coping saws or veneer saws or back saws or tenon saws or all the other kind of saws. A hand saw is just a single blade with a single handle. Now there are two kinds of hand saws. One designed to cut with the grain and the other designed to cut across the grain. Why you might ask? Well, let me show you something. Here's a piece of wood. And if I take a chisel, which is kind of like a knife, and I try and cut across the grain, first of all, it's difficult. And secondly, you'll notice that the edges are all very frayed. But if I cut with the grain, you can see the grain going in this direction, then I get a much smoother cut no frayed edges. So hand saws are designed into those saws primarily that you use when you want to cut across the grain. Those are called cross-cut hand saws and saws that you use when you want to cut with the grain. And those are called rip saws. That's what we're going to talk about today. Before we start talking about the rip saw, I just want to mention Japanese saws. These have become very, very popular these days. But in my shop, even though I have a couple and use them from time to time, they have a couple of disadvantages. One of which is that the blades are very, very thin, unlike the traditional Western hand saws, whose blades are also fairly thin, but they're strong. That means that if you're a traditional Japanese woodworker, typically working on the floor, you're holding the saw like this, and because the saw works on the pull stroke, the sawdust falls to the floor. But if you're using a Japanese saw on a Western bench like this, then because the saw is working on the pull stroke, you're pulling the sawdust into the curve. That doesn't make life very easy. And secondly, probably the most important reason is that almost all Western saws have teeth, no matter how they're filed, but which are basically triangular. You can see a triangular file will fit in to the teeth here. You have different size files, but the angles are always 60 degrees. Whereas, if you look at a Japanese saw, the teeth are much more complicated and it's beyond me to learn how to sharpen them. So although I have a couple of Japanese saws and use them on occasion, I much prefer Western saws. So we're talking about the rip saw and the rip saw is the saw that's designed to work like you saw me use the chisel to work with the grain. For it to do that, there are just three things that you need to be aware of. Firstly, you need to make sure that the teeth, before you've sharpened them or set them or bent them or done anything else, are all the same size. You can find, if you're lucky, a traditional tool called a saw jointer. And it's just a little metal device that holds a file there and the way you use it is to run this along the top of the saw until you can see a shiny spot on the top of every tooth. Now you know that all the teeth, even though they're not yet sharp, they're all the same height. If you don't have a saw jointer, you can make one. All you need is a file cut into a square piece of wood and you use it the same way. You put the wood against 
the side of the saw and it does the same thing. You run this up and down the saw until you've made a shiny spot on the top of every tooth. Now you have the teeth all the same size. The next thing to sharpen them is that you need a saw vise. Now here's a traditional saw vise which you can still buy new but there's no reason why if you don't have the actual device you can't simply clamp the saw blade between two pieces of wood in the vise. Then to sharpen you start at one end you find an appropriately sized three-sided file and you simply holding the file perfectly horizontal and perfectly square you file across until you've removed half the shiny spot that you made with the saw jointer. Then you miss a tooth and go to the next one and do the same thing, removing half the shiny spot. I like to do this in the morning listening to the news because it takes five or ten minutes to do it. It's not a big job. When that's over, then I come back and now I put the file in the gullet of the tooth past the one where I started and I do the same thing. And this time I should be able to keep filing until I remove the last of the shiny spot that the saw jointer made. After you've jointed the teeth and filed the teeth, there's only one more thing left to do, which is to set the teeth, which means to bend each alternate tooth out a little bit so that the kerf that the saw cuts is a little wider than the back of the blade. Otherwise, if the wood is wet or it's soft, you might find that the friction of the saw going through the wood is going to cause the wood to swell and the saw will bind. Now, just as a matter of interest, some saws, especially cross-cut saws, which we'll talk about in another episode, they have blades that are taper ground, meaning that the blade is actually thinner at this side than it is at the top. But whether you have a taper ground saw or not, the last thing you need to do is to set the teeth by bending them out. Years ago, we used a tool like this. This is called a saw rest, spelled W-R-E-S-T. And you'll notice that there are different size slots which correspond to the different size teeth. And all you do is to find the appropriate size slot, put it in there, and bend that tooth out a little bit. And then missing a tooth, you put it on the next tooth and bend that out, and so on all the way down. And then you come back and bend the other teeth tooth out the other way. That way, all the teeth form a shape like this, making the kerf that you cut with the saw a little wider than the back of the blade. That's basically all there is to know and all there is to do if you want to have a rip saw that's capable of cutting with the grain and have it cut easily and sharply. Okay, so just a couple of little tips about how to use your newly sharpened, jointed and set rip saw. It's often most easily done on a sawhorse and the trick is to put your knee on the work and don't start sawing until you've made a, enough of a curve. It's important to keep your thumb here and just make a few backstrokes to establish the curve until you get to the point where now you can go forward. Right? Now notice a couple of things. First of all, I'm only using three fingers in the handle. And the handle of these traditional saws is angled so that the effort that I put into sawing translates into moving the saw forward and pressing it down. And secondly, probably most important, is that I'm positioning myself so that I am directly over the blade and I can see both sides of the blade. 
keeping a hand here just in case the saw jumps out and wants to cut off my finger. I now, this is the biggest mistake that most beginners make, I'm using the entire length of the saw. There are teeth from here to here. You're wasting effort if you just use the middle of the saw. And secondly, I am not pushing. The saw is flat and straight and wants the saw in a straight line. If I push too hard, I'm liable to cause the saw to bind. So remember that. Keep a thumb there so the saw can't jump out and cut your thumb off or your finger off. Position yourself so you can see both sides of the blade and use gently use the saw the entire length. We'll do more of this in subsequent episodes, but that's your basic introduction to what a rip saw is, how to joint it, sharpen it, and set it, and how to use it. So I hope you like that. If you want to learn more, don't forget, hit the subscribe button and come back to watch the next episode and we'll talk some more about crosscut saws. Thanks for watching.